I'm John Hanna for CDTV.net in New York, and we have Ernest Cruikshank, the third Executive Vice President, Chief Investment Officer for Jameson First, joining us from Princeton, New Jersey. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. And on the other line, we have David Weiss, Visiting Fellow, Watson Institute, Brown University, joining us from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Thanks for joining us, David. Well, thank you. All right. So now, I mean, we're... Um, this market is really wild. Um, triple digits up, triple digits down. It's been what is it now? The second week now. Now, last week was the real wild one. This week, this week we've had one wild day. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, also the other thing that that came up to uh, to me via email is your um, uh, research notes or notes, uh, uh, Mr. Krukshank. Kru- well, those are those were written in a quieter time, but uh, we think for long-term investors, the uh, some of those principles uh, have some value. We uh, unfortunately, the market uh, volatility that David alludes to is uh, you can sort of throw out a lot of the fundamental long-term investment uh, principles, and uh, you're just dealing with nervousness and uh, and volatility. It's the byproduct of it. Now, with regards to um, the managing of assets, um, are, do you have dry powder now, or are you fully invested in the market, Ernest? Well, a lot of our individual clients, we have some specific assignments. It might be fixed income only or international only, but uh, the bulk of our individual clients are uh, invested in uh, balanced account assignments primarily with some international exposure and and uh, we have not modified our allocations that dramatically uh, the we're experienced some uh, uh, erosion in the equity portion of those portfolios but uh, the bonds are performing very nicely and that's uh, partly why uh, an individual would have them in a in a balanced account. So, um, if these uh, valuations on equities get to real extremes, one of the things that uh, any balanced account manager has to do at at uh, some point is to reallocate some money and and uh, to take money out of the asset uh, that's uh, performed well, such as fixed income and reallocate a portion of that to equity. So um, in the long run, that's uh, not a bad principle to follow. And do you have investments in gold, since everybody's talking about gold? We have modest, very limited exposures to gold. Uh, We have some indirect exposures to, we have modest uh, holdings in some mining companies. Uh, We have some indirect exposures on the international side to some of the exchange traded funds from places such as Canada, Australia, where there may be mining activity. So, but uh, direct investments in gold, no, we do not. And the uh, biggest holding that you have right now, which part of the uh, uh, industry or sector within the equity market? The uh, fortunately, we have always had, given a, a conservative client base and a conservative equity approach, uh, we have significant exposures in healthcare and consumer staples. Those are, you know, they have eroded a bit, but they're certainly doing a little better than market. We also have underweights in, um, our biggest underweight is in financials, which uh, has helped us a lot. But again, it's uh, hard to cheer those things that you, that have gone well, because even things that have gone well on a relative basis are still uh, down in value in this kind of climate. So it's, uh, it doesn't give you a lot of, a uh, lot to cheer about. Um, David, um, any um, questions for uh, Ernest? No, obviously the I mean the big issue that we're seeing is this huge volatility in the market, and um, I guess one thing I'd take objection is that you know this 
<laughs> you should ignore the fundamentals. The market's ignoring the fundamentals, certainly on its day-to-day -day moves. But I think from the investor standpoint, this is almost the time to go back to basics, especially the basic of diversification. So with something uh, this volatile, um, what do you think is the potential for uh, income at uh, this kind of situation, David? Um, you mean uh, from bond market standpoint or from... From everything. Basically, like any investments at all would be... What would be a, a, a silver lining out of all this chaos right now? I'm not sure there's very much of a silver lining in this. Um, I think that okay. obviously some of these prices have come down to levels that are starting to look attractive. So in the long run, there may be a silver lining. Some of the stocks are almost starting to look like bargains again, but you know there may be even bigger bargains next week. Um, that's always the problem. Um, until things sort of stabilize, most people are too nervous to get back in the market. The yields on fixed income assets are just so abysmally low, it's hard to get back, you know, hard to get very excited about them. And you know, you're sort of back to the words of uh, the immortal sage, you know, I'm not worried about the return on my investment, I'm worried about the return of my investment. <laughs> I always like that statement. <laughs> uh, Ernest, what, what, what's your point? What's your uh, uh, well? I I agree with David. I I think that uh, we're in an extremely unusual period here with short-term interest rates so extraordinarily low. I mean, an investor in a money fund is basically earning zero. Uh, an investor in treasury bills is essentially earning zero. Uh, you're getting a sub a sub. A one percent yield on in the treasury market and maturities uh, out to, to five years, and so uh, there certainly are reasons why investors looking for income might be tempted and and perhaps should be tempted to try to pick out some stable companies where dividend yields are in the range of three, four, five percent. Um, but again, as David says, when you're in a period of extreme volatility, you can uh, you can be premature entering the market and experiencing a sell-off uh, uh, subsequently. So, I think um, ultimately one of the props for the market equity market in here will be uh, perhaps some asset allocation shifts at some point by. Uh, pension funds. I don't think we're seeing that yet. Uh, you could also, you're certainly seeing, I think yesterday the market bottomed out after the first half hour of a very sharp sell off. You probably had the equity market supported in part there by companies buying their shares back. And uh, this would be a, a, certainly they are one of the participants in the market that can definitely have the, the cash and the wherewithal to buy back shares. They can borrow money cheap in the bond market, cheaply in the bond market, and they can, uh, uh, they're certainly getting a better opportunity to buy, buy shares back. So I think that's uh, another prop that's out there. But uh, until we see a few of these issues domestically and internationally uh, resolved or at least offer, see some movement in a positive direction, uh, volatility will remain. Now, uh, since you brought up the uh, buyback of shares, that was going to be my next question, a couple of questions down on my list here. But um, uh, so let's, let's talk about this now, uh, buyback of shares and potential for mergers and acquisition because, like I said, money's cheap out there for like um, borrowing. Um, question goes to you first, Ernest, and I'm going to ask uh, David uh, next, uh, is that what industry is potentially ripe for M&A, uh, Ernest? Well, I think you're not seeing as much activity by the... Uh, financial players in, in buyouts. I, what I do think you're seeing, and we continue to see, uh, some strategic acquisitions being made by companies that are uh, uh, well financed, uh, particularly some of these companies that have cash overseas. Uh, the Hewlett Packard announcement overnight of uh, the purchase of autonomy in, in uh, the UK and may be a great example of a strategic move by a, 
a large U.S. multinational that has cash overseas, and they're uh, uh, they're, uh, they're they're taking action with uh, with that cash that they have a hard time repatriating. Uh, but you're seeing it in you, we've seen some move uh, activity certainly in the technology space. We've seen it in uh, in certain consumer areas. We've seen it in the healthcare. We've seen consolidation there. So I think strategic uh, acquisitions will continue. Um, but uh, certain technology has been a, a very active space over the last few months. David, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I would agree generally. I mean, the, the point is corporations are sitting on record levels of cash. The cost of acquiring long-term debt is at a record low, and corporate treasurers are sopping the stuff up about as fast as they can. Um, they got to do something with that cash. They can't just sit on it. And the logical thing or the most likely thing to do with it is acquisition. Um, I think uh, Ernest is right that a lot of this is going to be international. Um, partially because they have offshore cash that's easier to use internationally. Um, but I think you also should not ignore international going the other direction. I think you see a fair amount of acquisition of U.S. companies, especially as the dollar becomes more competitive by, their, by foreign firms, uh, whether Asian or European, because um, they're in you know, much of the same boat. Um, it's just not exciting to build new plants right now just doesn't look very promising, so that means you're going to use that cash by somebody else, um, especially ones in industries where prices are knocked down, and I think I would include financials in that. Technology is always a big play, um, but I think it's going to be fairly general. Okay, uh, closing statement about the, um, in general, investing-wise, uh, Ernest, what, what do you tell your clients? Well, I think you, you know, I think you have to be. Uh, I think you certainly have to have a balanced type of investment approach. Um, you have to be across several asset classes. I think you need to be uh, diversified within a number of uh, sectors of the market. Uh, we have a bias towards companies that have. A, uh, an international presence, so, so they have some exposure to global growth, uh, growth in those areas where the Far East and uh, and elsewhere. And uh, I, I think that the important thing is to stick with a plan and uh, and not be uh, panicked out of um, the equity market um, after the kind of declines that we've seen. And yet, at the same time, you have to have patience because it may be a while before we can anticipate a uh, robust recovery. But the main thing is to uh, stay in quality, uh, with quality names, companies that uh, can withstand a, a slowdown in economic activity and companies that are well-financed, good balance sheets, and um, a, a strong uh, industry position. That's. Uh, but uh, the, the, in the short term, uh, it's difficult to predict the, uh, the direction we may see. Uh, David, closing statement? No, I think um, from an investor standpoint, the main point is that this is going to be slow. Um, these kind of recessions marked by excessive levels of debt, by the need to cut back on consumer debt, the need to cut back on government debt, not just in the U.S., but worldwide, makes it very hard to get much growth going coming out of a recession. Um, you need patience. Patience is a virtue, but it's not a lot of fun. That's David Weiss, visiting fellow, Watson Institute, Brown University, joining us from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. And the other person is Ernest Cruikshank III, Executive Vice President, Chief Investment Officer for Jameson First, joining us from Princeton, New Jersey. And I'm John Hanna for CDTV.net in New York. Thank you, gentlemen, and have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.